Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And as always, first many many thanks to all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, in today's part 55, we will talk about the second part of the important fundamental theorem of calculus. In the last part, we've discussed what an antiderivative for a continuous function is and how we can calculate one. And maybe surprisingly, this one was given by an integral. Therefore, first I want to start here by telling you that if you have one antiderivative, you essentially have all of them. And indeed, this is a nice thing because it will help us calculating integrals. Now, the overall assumptions we need are the same as last time. We have an interval i and f is defined on this interval and a continuous function. Okay, now we know such a function f has an antiderivative and usually we call it capital F. So these are the assumptions of our proposition and now the claim of the proposition comes in when we look at another function we call capital G. Now this function capital G could be another antiderivative of f. However, it turns out this is the case if and only if the function given by f minus g is a constant function. In other words, each antiderivative of f is given by capital F plus a constant. Therefore, you can say, if we ignore such constant terms, the antiderivative is indeed uniquely given. So you see, this proposition here is a nice result we can use and therefore we should talk about the proof. And because we want to show an equivalence, the proof consists of two parts. So we just start with the first implication from left to right. Therefore, the assumption is now that we have two antiderivatives given. And then we just need to look at the difference function here and show that this is constant. And now because we talked a lot about finding local extrema, you know being constant means that the derivative is zero. This argument works because we know the antiderivatives are differentiable. Moreover, we also know we have linearity for forming derivatives. More precisely, we can write this as f prime minus g prime. And now we can simply use the fact that both functions are antiderivatives of f. Therefore, we have f minus f, which is, as you also know, just zero. Hence, we can just conclude that f minus g is a constant function. Now, what comes in here is the mean value theorem and in fact, we have exactly proven this in part 41. Okay, with this you see, the first implication here is finished. Then, let's immediately go to the second one. Which means, now we assume that the difference here is constant. We can concretize this by saying that we have a constant number c and this function is equal to this constant. So f of x minus g of x is equal to a number c. And of course, without writing down, this holds for every x in i. Then in the next step, we can simply write that the function g is equal to the function f minus c. Now you see, by assumption, f is differentiable because it's an antiderivative, therefore the function f minus c is differentiable and therefore also g. And then we conclude we can form the derivative on both sides. However, then of course the constant will vanish on the right hand side. So it just remains that f prime is equal to lowercase f. Simply because it's an antiderivative of f. However, this also means that g is an antiderivative of f. And please don't forget, this is exactly what we wanted to show here. So in summary, the whole proof is finished and we have this nice result here. And now I want to apply it immediately to the next theorem. Indeed, this will be the important second fundamental theorem of calculus. So as you can see, this should be something you really should remember. Now, the assumptions here are not different from before, we still have our interval and the continuous function f. Moreover, we need an antiderivative again and let's call it capital F of course. 
And then the result is that we can calculate the Riemann integral of f from a to b. There, of course, the numbers a and b should be chosen from the interval i. And then we can say this integral of f here is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. And there you see, it does not matter which antiderivative we choose, because a possible constant here would just vanish in the difference. Now, for explicit calculations, it's helpful to have a short notation for this difference on the right hand side. One simply writes f or f of x, and then comes a vertical line with a and b on it. So you would read this as f of the upper number minus f of the lower number. Now in summary, you should see this is such a nice result because it tells us that we don't need the approximation with step functions anymore to calculate an integral. If you know an antiderivative of f, you can immediately use it to calculate an integral. Therefore maybe before we do the proof, let's look at an example and see how this works. So I would say, let's take the cosine function. So our f is the cosine and now we look at an integral and maybe from 0 to 1. Hence you see, this is definitely an integral we don't want to approximate with step functions. Now the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us just use an antiderivative. And of course we know if we form the derivative of sine of x, we get the cosine of x. Therefore, this is an antiderivative we can use. Now, the calculation just tells us put in 1 and put in 0. However, sine of 0 is 0, therefore only sine of 1 remains. And there you see, sine of 1 is the value of this integral here. Okay, now proving this theorem is not hard at all when we use the first fundamental theorem of calculus from the last video. However, there we skip the proof of it and therefore I would say we do both proofs in the next video. So with this, I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.